Sunday was the one-year anniversary of the eviction of McPherson Square and um, Occupy DC, and they went through a transition. So we have um, some of the Occupy DC people here, and these are also members of the DC media group. Um, welcome, Organizer X, in the chat stream. And so what we're going to do is have a little reflection on the year since the eviction. Um, it's going to be kind of a loose and free-flowing conversation. So we will um, see, you know, just what comes out of it. And um, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to the group there in the square. Welcome, you guys. Thanks for being here tonight. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark and everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're doing an outside show, so we're lucky that the weather is cooperating, and we appreciate you guys being able to brave the cold in the evening. So why don't you set up the scene for us as you're sitting there. Tell us what's behind you and what's going on, and let's go ahead and uh, kick it off. Well, tonight, we're, we're, as you said, we're here at McPherson Square. Uh, the Pearson statue is directly behind us, and we actually ran into about 10 to 15 Occupy DC action committee people. So it looks like Occupy DC is still alive. I'm not sure if they're still going by Occupy DC, but uh, there is still stuff going on here in DC. Well, that that's inspiring and good to hear. Um, I guess everybody's gearing up for another active spring, hopefully. Um, so why don't we get right into it, your experiences, um, maybe leading up to uh, the event last last year uh, where the Ten of Dreams was, was put up and the eviction happened. And I'd be interested in how your perspective of the movement is how it has affected you as being longtime participants in the movement, and what do you see the the futures are? So we can just, you know, whoever wants to start off, just just fire away, and uh, we'll just kind of, you know, have the conversation as it unfolds. Could you repeat your question mark? Because I didn't quite hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I said. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you were doing prior to Occupy and then the events leading up to the eviction and then the subsequent year and how that has affected your life. And you you came to the movement with a with a prehistory of activism, and then you became active and engaged with the Occupy DC events. I'm sorry, Mark. We got traffic going by. I can't hear you at all. Oh, okay. Think one more time. Yeah. I said you were you had a prehistory of activism before Occupy, and as the Occupy DC ramped up you became active in in that organization. Um, did you spend much time in and around McPherson and also the Freedom Plaza in the early days? Um, 
I wasn't involved in October. I was actually sick, but um, I started getting involved in November. And I wasn't a sleeper the way that Don was. Um, I didn't actually sleep in the park, um, but I went to GAs. Um, I, you know, I went to a lot of actions. Um, I became involved in some of the Occupy Highway actions, walking, uh, supporting marches from uh, D.C. to Richmond and Richmond to D.C. Um, and then um, became, you know, started my blog and um, taking pictures of Occupy. And were you on the scene on the day of the eviction by any chance? Oh, yeah. Um, it started very, very early in the morning, and I got word of it about 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I tail it is down here. And as far as you can remember, what was the what was the scene like? I know it was it was a beautiful day, and there was a lot of people. But what was the vibe like? Um, it it was kind of confused. Um, I wasn't here at 5:45 when they really rolled in with uh, with the helicopters, the real paramilitary force. Um, I think that would have been a scary moment, and I, you know, I, I can't say firsthand how that went. By the time I got here, it, it was a little bit confused um, because it was quieter. The police were setting up. Um, it was. They also made a statement um, with a spokesman saying that this was not an eviction. They they tried to make this quite clear, and in retrospect, it seems um, a very obvious attempt to, that this was one of their tactics of um, manipulation, of managing the situation, that they didn't want this to go the way that so many other occupation evictions had gone in other cities. They uh, wanted to manage the occupiers in a way that they wouldn't become, uh, they wouldn't cause any up unrest. They just wanted to slowly get them out. Um, so they basically lied at the beginning of the day, saying this is not an eviction, but um, it was. It was an eviction. And how have, you know, the events since then, in the year since the eviction, you want to provide some reflection on that? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about what is happening around the movement now in the city? And, and how that affected you personally? Um, Occupy hasn't had a great impact on me and my life and how I spend my time and energy. Um, you know, it's been quite quite a ride. And I would not only say it started the day of the eviction. Um, you know, Occupy didn't die um, the day of uh, the eviction on February 4th. I think it was born with the ten of dreams. On, um, about January uh, 29th and 30th. Um, I think that's the spirit that we still have and that we still live out of, that, um, you know, that we dream big now. Um, it's hard to say whether things still live under the name Occupy, um, but there have been so many people transformed in the way that we have that there's still... Uh, a lot of activity, a lot of energy that's under the surface. Things that are still happening. Um, and and I would like to point out there's an enormous amount happening. Um, for instance, the the coming together of all of you guys that work new media in the city and forming the DC Media Group. So that was formed out of a need to cover the ever increasing events and bring more stories out. So it's a it's a clear indication that things are still happening and progressing progressing there. Um, John, what a, what about you? Tell us your your story. Well, my story is that I have been at uh, Occupy or was at Occupy from the very beginning. Uh, one of the first people who was there on the scene before any tents had gone up. I just happened to be going by the park 
one night and I saw a small group of individuals, uh, young, mostly very young people, hanging out. And I happened to work one block away from here at FedEx. And that was my second job. And I just happened to be walking by and I saw them ask them what they were doing. And they were talking about economic issues, about social issues. And I was very interested in that because these were concerns I'd had for a very long time. So on the third night, somebody actually put a tent in my hand, gave me a tent and a sleeping bag too. And I was one of the first people to put up a tent right there in the center, right by McPherson's uh, statue. And I stayed there the entire time up to the 4th of February. I think I only missed maybe three nights staying in the park. It was very difficult. It was very challenging. Um, I'm not an, an activist prior to this. I was not in, into activism, but I had a lot of concerns about the direction of the country. It just seems like more and more that ordinary people are struggling harder and harder to get farther and farther behind. And so this was my seminal moment. This was the moment that I chose to take my stand, so to speak. Accidentally, I became involved in activism. And I found each day to be a new challenge. I had a new education in the four months that I was in the park, I learned more than in four years of going to college. I educated myself on just about everything I heard, read up on it, went on to social media, studied it, so I knew what was happening, so I could be articulate in, in discussing with media if they came by. And from an early point in this occupation, I realized that media was the key. But the problem was that we could not control what the media was saying about us. And often what the media was saying was very disingenuous. It was very, it was hard to swallow that, it was being told. They looked at us from the surface and not from the heart and mind of what we were trying to do. So I knew that somehow we had to form our, our own media collective. And I'm not sure exactly how it fell into place, but next, uh, after, much, I'm going to spin forward here, much after the eviction, um, we, we formed this, this collective, this media collective, which I think has been very effective in covering events, and it's actually doing very well. I also have to say that Don has written down the, the story of the eviction from his point of view, um, which you can often find on fullrevolution.net, um, along with the video that he took of that day. Um, and he's, he's really done a great job of, of bringing to light the, the issues that brought Occupy, occupiers to the Pearson Square and um, you know, what it was like on that day of the eviction. Um, and that, that brings up another point, and John touched on media, and, and Rob, I want, want you to weigh in on this also. Um, prior to Occupy, and you, you were a writer and a photographer, you, you were blogging and taking photos prior to the to Occupy and to all that. I wasn't a writer and um, I wasn't a photographer at all. Um, so this was really different um, for me to take this role, you know, more as an observer and, and reporting what happened. So yeah, I, I really fell in love with Occupy and it inspired me to start a blog about it. Okay, so so the movement essentially inspired you to be a documentarian. How about you, John? Had you ever done anything like that? Because you're you're like you're a mad live tweeter. You write wonderfully. We we see you on Cool Revolution and also on DC Mic Check in those publications. Had you ever done, you know, any kind of media work at all before the movement? I, I have never written about activism. I have never used photography to promote or to pass news before, to create news. So this is all new for me, and it just came naturally for me to do this, to talk about something that I really believed in. To videotape. The, the vid actually, if you go to coolrevolution.net, like Adam was saying a minute ago, you'll actually see on today's post the video that I took of the moment of the eviction 
in the, the northeast corner of the park. The police actually came through with barricades, with metal barricades that physically were pushing people out of the park. And it's a very, very dramatic moment in the day of the eviction. If you look at that video, you can see a lot of anger on people's faces. You can see a lot of emotion, people screaming, and, and police were very organized, very forceful. Um, and I mentioned this to, to some of the other activists, but it, it not trying to bring as uh, a racial issue, a social issue, more, but it was kind of the first time that, that I witnessed uh, Caucasians getting the front of law right down their throats. Occupy was that. It, it was the same thing that African Americans have been crying about the police for a long time in, in, in their neighborhoods. And it came home to white America that police can be used in a very arbitrary way. Now, why do I say arbitrary? It's not that I agree with with going up against police or authority, but the Constitution calls us the duty to do things. John, hold on, because the sirens are really wiping you out, and I don't want to lose the thought. And on that, in this particular uh, occupation, at this location, in the center of so-called democracy. That's exactly what we were doing. We were going up against authority, and the, the response by society was to send in paramilitary troopers to throw us out of this park. The video is a testament to exactly what happened that day. Um, and, and I'd like to compliment you also on your documentary abilities. Rob, how about you? Had you ever done any media before the movement? For the moment, uh, as far as media stuff, I moved to Maryland uh, in 2004, and every single protest I heard about, no matter what it was, I would go out and photo with them. If it was Tea Party or uh, the 2008 big anti-war protest, I would go out and just take tons of photos of it, and just, uh, just write short captions with the photos and put it up on Facebook. So, but it's, I, I've been, like Anne, I've been a part of non-profit sort of work uh, out in California. I lived in Los Angeles for 10 years, and I, I very vividly remember welfare reform, and I was working for, uh, as an addictions counselor. And I was volunteering for Chrysalis uh, right around the corner on Washington Boulevard in Santa Monica uh, for the homeless. And it, it was a drop-in center. And, and, I, and I kept hearing from people in charge of these nonprofits saying that there were massive budget cuts coming. And I felt terrible for these people. So I organized a, a sort of... A, group therapy group for people looking for work because my feeling was you know if if the economy is going to get tougher then workers need to be tougher and what better way than people getting together and working together to build those skills and so it's I too had, had always had an affinity for uh, social justice issues and paid very close attention to to political issues. You know, I, I read the papers almost every day. Uh, anybody who sees my Twitter account, I'm constantly posting news stuff. I'm waiting for somebody on the DC media group to say, hey, stop putting that shit on the DC. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to do with DC, but I keep it to a minimum on, on our collective page. Uh, but I, I also I do most of that on Occupied News Network. Who uh, I work with somebody else during the occupation here in D.C. That's another Facebook page. That's a uh, just world political and activist news. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you want me to to go ahead now. Yeah, yeah, go I'm ahead, gonna, and I I want to hear you know your 
the the time up to the eviction you know the post eviction and your reflections on that and kind of where we are now um I, w I was here on day one. When, it, when I heard about October October 2011, Kevin Zeese's uh, camp, um, I was crazy about that location. I, by then, I had been to enough activist events here in D.C. and seeing what was happening with Occupy Wall Street, which I, I thought was phenomenal. And I, I instantaneously got connected with Mobile Revolution. Um, I didn't think that Freedom Plaza was the perfect place to have a camp because it's cold out there. It's a corridor. And, and if things were to go into the winter as it had, it would be really cold. And, and I had hoped that somebody would find a location that wasn't so out in the open. And when I had heard that uh, the Christmas Square was getting together a week before. You know, I, I connected with the McPherson Square people on day one, mm -hmm. and and it was interesting. Day one, I, I got out here at around four o'clock, and right around six o'clock, right after right after we closed our first general assembly, uh, Obama and Michelle, Barack Obama, and Michelle Obama came through. Uh, they were, it, it was on their anniversary, so they drove past the park, and I got a video recording of that. But uh, you know, it, it was and it, Occupy DC. We we were talking about this before, and Occupy DC was an inspiration of hope um, for me. It, there were there was a lot of great stuff going on during the first month. Uh, one, you know, I connected with John. You know, very soon into it, we were building structures, and and, uh, and and it was great. It was what it was for me was, you know, you sit at home and you read the news, or you go. You know, one of the things of my past activism writing was on the RedCafe.net, which is a a UK footy site. They have a current events section. So I've been writing about social justice and political issues since probably probably uh, 1989, um, when the internet was just starting to become more popular in, in people's homes. Um, but it's when you meet the people, it, it, it was it, I was awestruck to meet so many people who I connected with. That it was exhilarating. You know, it was. It was. We felt like we could get something done. But uh, it, it was. It was exhilarating, and and it, and it was very difficult because you know the population of the camp were mostly millennials who took charge of the camp, and. And, and and they had every right to take charge of the camp, I feel, because they're 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 getting screwed worse than anybody. Mm -hmm. When you look at the graduation rate of uh, employment at 50%, you know you're damn straight. They should be pissed off and trying to do something. Um, but they didn't have the years that John and I had, and and Anne, and and the knowledge of know what glass steel was. I, you know, I would ask people if they knew what glass steel was. You know, I I would almost get that some of them thought it was some kind of microbrewery, you know, from South Philly or New York. Right? But but people learn. We we had workshops very quickly. Um, I got together with uh, Nicole Aro from from a uh, Sunlight Foundation. At the and I asked her to put on workshops, to teach people what what Glass Steagall was about, what the SEC was about, what super PACs were. And so people were learning quickly. And and, and it was great that you know 
to go from, you know, I think our first or second action was going down to the Koch brothers. People didn't know exactly why they were protesting the Koch brothers, but within a couple of weeks, they knew mm -hmm. why they were protesting the Koch brothers. Right. And, uh, it was a steep learning curve all around. I mean, John has talked about all the things that he learned in such a short period of time, but you also have to think about the management of the camp was it's just that it happened at all. It's incredible. Um, when, when human beings come together in groups, they usually don't get along very well. And especially for the modern human being who doesn't uh, live in isolation most of the time, we don't know how to live those communities very well. And I think so much energy had to be expended in just making this camp minimally function. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with, with food and, and getting people to cooperate. And um, what a lot of people don't understand about a lot of these occupied encampments is that they were half homeless. I mean, they weren't activists at all. There were people just lived on the street and moving into a tent was an upgrade. Uh, so you have to understand how much energy was put into just running a camp, uh, dealing with security and police and, you know, dealing with just human relations. And then on top of it, trying to build a movement, right. trying to have access that um, it, it was a heady, crazy, they, every day was packed. Yep. I, I'd, like to I'd like to pursue that, that tangent of the education a little bit because that's something I'm interested in. And you mentioned it was a steep learning curve. There were teach-ins going on. There were discussions. So people were all gathering this information uh, from all sources and digesting it and doing things with it. Um, in, the, in the time that has transpired, do those sorts of things still happen somewhere and somehow in the community? That educational well, process? Yeah, we actually do have a, a wonderful thing that's come out of Occupy. We have created a preschool at the Peace House. So the concept of free teaching and there's no tuition, anybody can come to teach, Anybody can come to learn. It's a collective. Um, one of the concepts that I learned in, in the occupation was that, as, as Anne was saying, is that when a group of people come together to solve problems, you'll be surprised at what they can do with just themselves, their minds, and their hands. And one of the things that we were able to do in this occupation was create collectives where people could tap into them and, and use what they needed and and then bow out or leave or whatever. We had a kitchen, we had a library, we had an information tent, we had a university tent, we had mini pods where people could come and find protection. We had a woman's pod where just women were allowed to be in that area for protection. Uh, because as, as became apparent, there was a lot of repressive behaviors out in the park. There were a lot of repressive behaviors in society. There were a lot of homeless in the park. So even the homeless became knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what the teachings were. But getting back to education was a very steep learning curve. But if you just kept yourself, your wits about you, kept an open mind, it was amazing what you could learn. And the millennials that Rob was uh, referencing had an incredible knowledge base of things that I never heard of. So I was awed by that information flow. Um, the social media was kind of new to me. I didn't spend much time on social media, but now I'm totally immersed in it. Live streaming was a new concept. Media, all of these things came together, and we focused on a lot of energy in a small place in a small amount of time. And we, like Noam Chomsky said, like Ann just reflected, we lit a spark. There have been some incredible changes as a result of the fact that occupations sprung up all around the country and they created a critical mass and we knew we know that we were having an effect by the fact that so many police 
so many authorities were, were following us. The FBI was monitoring us as if we were a domestic terrorist group, which is absolutely silly. I, I still can't believe that they had to redact so much information from those FOIA requests. They redacted nearly 90% of the information off those FOIA requests. So we know we were having a, a dramatic impact. And when you look at the reports that are coming out, the investigations by the SEC against banks, against the Standard & Poor's, about the LIBOR, about the, the mortgage fraud, the rampant fraud on Wall Street in these banks, that proves justification for what we did. Right. Also, on, along the lines of education and media, uh, I have to mention Global Revolution. Uh, week two, uh, Global Re Revolution sent five or six guys, Lux Rostrum, Makatan, Craig, and several others, to come down and help train our media team. And they stayed with us. Uh, Lux had been in and out of the camp constantly, but he was mostly with us for two or three solid months. And, but, and the time and effort that they put into it, you know, and, and it's, and I, I don't know, I, I go on to other streams and I see people trash Global Revolution, but I have the utmost respect of what the groundwork that they laid out. They traveled around the country, training different cities how to live stream and how to produce their media. And, and it's, I don't, I don't know. It's I. I have a debt of gratitude towards Global Revolution. Lad and Flux. I have the kid Flux. You know, if he is watching, I know he liked this on the Occupy Streams Facebook. There isn't anybody in the Occupy movement who has the worst luck when some shit is going to go down. Flux just happens to leave the day before. <laughs> Uh, I bet he's a great fisherman, you know. It's like, oh, you should have been here. They were biting great yesterday. <laughs> um, and it happened with the New York eviction. He fell asleep, exhausted, and he missed the New York eviction. He left the day before the Occupy D.C. eviction. He stuck it out here for so long. He kept coming back when it, whenever it seemed like we were getting close to an eviction. But, uh... But like, like I said, it's, and I probably wouldn't have met Anne if it weren't for Flux. Uh, I met Anne I, in the park here, during, I think during the 10th grade, or right around that no, time. No, I met you because I, I emailed you about interviewing people. Right. About the time of year. It was after the eviction. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it, it, there are the collaboration and learning from each other. And this is something I, I really wanted to to express tonight. You know, it, it's like I learned from Anne, you know, the inspiration of trying to write things a little bit better. You know, John, the way he interviews people with such empathy. You know, Jen Ox, you know, it's just tireless the way she she just works and works and works and works. You know, and it's it, there are just so many people involved in our group, and what I learned from them is this: it's like what John said. I, I can go to college for six years and not learn stuff, you know, and it's that working together and learning from each other that is so so valuable that I couldn't possibly dream of, you know, sitting in a class. And, and it, you know, school is great, but getting out and doing it. With, with other people is so meaningful. You know, and I have such a great appreciation for the team that we work with mm -hmm. and, and watching other teams. You know, it's, you know, having Punk Boy come down, you know, we, we got together with Punk Boy in New York City and, and learning from Punk Boy. And, and it's just all around the country. It, it, that's, that's what I loved about Occupy probably more than anything. All of the just incredible people. Mike Bluehair from, from Portland. And it, it's just it's just endless. It's people from Chicago and San Diego. 
that's, that was a gift of Occupy DC, being the nation's capital. So many people came here from so many different cities, and we were all able to learn from each other and and, and work in a similar direction. And it was. It was kind of disheartening to hear the media say that we were scattered and we didn't have, you know, a singular message. But, but there were. I, I believe that there were a handful of messages that were very, very strong that we all learned about and we all worked towards. Maybe, maybe the ends didn't come out the way we wanted them to. But, uh, I don't know, I... I sat down with my daughter uh, two or three weeks ago, and she's kind of resentful that I've spent so much time on the Occupy movement. And I sat down with her, and I looked her eye to eye, and I said, I'm doing this for you. You know, if this country does go to shit, you know, at least you can look me in the eye ten years from now and say, thank you, Dad, for trying. That's a really good point because the I have found, you know, working with Occupy since the beginning, it can be a giant sinkhole of time because you're driven to contribute. You know, things happen at all hours. Learning some of the things that we do, the technology, all the tools, you know, all the right, everything we do, it takes time. But it's a valuable investment. Even even if we, some of us, are older, we may not see the result in our lifetime, but we're moving it in the right direction. I, I missed that last part. What was I, that? I said some of us are older, and we may not see the result in our lifetime, but we're moving it in the right direction. So I feel like I'm working for your daughter. <laughs> right. Hey, and you know what? And my my daughter understood. And my daughter looked at me and she felt like, and, he, and she said thank you. So it, and 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 that's another whole thing about the Occupy movement. It's 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 all about perspective. Yeah, you know, one one thing I wanted to say, um, we you'd asked a question earlier about how it it changes individually, um, and I really didn't weigh in too much on that, but. I spoke to it on, from the semblance of education, but it, it changed me in a lot of different ways. From a personal, when I look back at my life before Occupy and my life during and after, I'm, it's changed me in a lot of ways. I look at things completely different. Um, I'm more likely to ask the question, is it really so, whenever I hear something in the media, or if, if I just hear ordinary people make a statement, I, 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 the first thing I ask myself, is it really so? And then I seek out to find. And a lot of times I, I find agree. out that the answer that I found is, is very, <laughs> very unlike what I expected and very disappointing. Sometimes I find the answer is, is instructional and I learn from that and go on. But also it's changed me from a spiritual point of view too. It changed me, it was a challenge physically to stay out in this park um, yeah, right. It was that the was hardest thing I ever did. That was with military service and running marathons. So this was a very difficult, difficult, challenging, physical thing to do. But spiritually, it's probably the biggest thing that's changed about me. Um, it, it caused me to question all of the teaching and all of the understanding I had about human beings, myself. Uh, I, I believe that now, as a result of this, that compassion for the self has to come first before compassion for others. But you can't be a good activist. You don't know what compassion is for yourself. When you're out there trying to save the world, you're going to fail. There's just no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to understand what the self really is. And, and that in itself is, is something that I'm still trying to do. But compassion has to start here for yourself and then work out towards others. Once you figure that out, then you're more equipped to do what you need to do. So Occupy changed me spiritually, challenged me physical and intellectually. If 
I'm a completely different person. I don't think, one of the things I found out is that I don't think that our government is capable of solving the problems that we are facing. The big thing is that it, that doesn't mean that these problems can't be solved. It, what it does mean is it challenges communities and individuals to get involved in their directly in what needs to be done. And people keep waiting for the government to fix the economy. They keep waiting for the government to fix the, the extensive expenditures that we make on the military, for example. That's not going to happen. People need to get involved in that. They can't wait and let politicians and, lo and local legislatures do these things. If they don't express themselves and their concerns, they're going to be flighted, and that's what happens to the middle class. And, the, and the, unfortunately, and the lower classes, if you want to characterize it like that. I would have like to that. say, like, we, we, we have to rise up. And, and that was one thing that I got from Occupy is it's really radical and I've always been pretty radical, um, but I, I, I was just I was so happy when people got out on the street, and I realized how energizing it was. Now I think a lot of energy was misdirected with Occupy, um, or or wasted maybe. But we have to make our government do what it needs to do. Um, I. I think there's a lot that government can change. We have to change our policies on a number of things, but nothing is going to happen unless people get out on the streets and say no more of this. Absolutely, positively no more. Um, I think we're taught a powerlessness by the media that everything is so overwhelming, there's nothing we can do except fall back into cynicism. And this is a change that I found with Occupy was instead of powerlessness, instead of falling back into, you know, cynical making fun of things, you know, I could be part of something and, and you know, it was a statement of hope. Um, even for most of us, it was putting us out there for ridicule. Um, but it was a positive action. Instead of saying, I'm going to leave it up uh, or I'm just, you know, not going to get involved at all. It's just too big. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to say, we're going to hell in a handbasket here, and I have to do something. Because this tidal wave was coming. And, you know, like Rob said, I want to be able to look people in the eye when it comes, if it does come, and say, I did what I could. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't want to be able to just say that I did what I could. I want to make a difference. Um, and, I, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Anne, because I've spoken to you many times, but I really think that we can make a difference, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I spend almost every extra bit of time that I have uh, not ignoring myself, but working on things that are important. Working on the self is, is that most important. You have to take care of your health, your spirituality, your mental and physical health, and then you're equipped to do what you can. Out in, in a movement. Um, but the, the challenges are profound and difficult, but that doesn't mean they can't be solved. Yeah, they're, 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 they're like the global warming issue is probably takes the cake right now with what's what's facing us next Saturday. Uh, correction, next Sunday, this coming Sunday, the 17th, we're going to be having a Ford on Climate rally at the White House, and that that's a seminal moment for the world. We've got our energy companies acting very indiscriminately and very irresponsibly with pumping fossil fuels out when they know that this is going to da further damage us and push us farther beyond beyond the, the limit that the what Mother Earth can take. And so I think we can make a difference, but we just have to keep working towards that. So, so John, John has. Something else that I want to mention is uh, Occupied World News now. Uh, I was on there today, and they're celebrating their one year this week. Um, they too. You, you look at the evolution of what Northern and that group of people have done, and educating people is just phenomenal. It, it's just. I have the deepest respect of when, when 
people look at Occupy and go, okay, well, what have you done? I think OWNN is a great example of an Occupy accomplishment. You know, Northern, every single day, what is it, three times a day or four times a day? Four times, yeah. You know, he, does, he does the news, and it's news where people can put, it's put in the news and he reads it off. So it's not just Northern doing it. It's participatory. And, uh, and, and that's what it should be. You know, it, it's, there's no controlling it. So uh, we, have, we have come a long way, and we still have a long way to go. And, uh, and, and artists are you as well. The documentaries and, and the interviews that you put up, uh, everything that we've learned from you, you know, is is incredibly valuable. You know, so, when you talk about my experience with Occupy, it's you, it's Northern, it's the people sitting here next to me, you know, it's the people in the chat rooms, you know, it's everyone. You know, it, it's not me and what I know. I was saying this to John and Anna earlier. One thing, no matter how much knowledge I brought to the Occupy movement, the one thing that I know throughout Occupy month as the months go by, you know, I realize I I know less mm -hmm. because there's so much more to learn. You know, yeah. and it's this is a very very humbling experience to go through this process of working with media and talking to people on the streets or standing out and uh, standing with Ann over at We Act Radio and finding out that Barney Frank doesn't give a shit about you and the 7,000 people who were arrested yeah, over the past year. Barney Frank doesn't give a shit about you. Just so you know. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we can make that. We made that clear. That's might, the oh. news tonight. That'll be on, on OWNN's 11 o'clock news. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we might know John McCain doesn't give a shit about you, but to hear, to experience John McCain saying that to my face two weeks ago, a couple blocks away from here, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it, it's an experience, and it's very real. And, and and to be able to share that with people is important. It, it's a different experience too, thinking in a ton of journalism, journal, journalist role, that, oh, I, I discovered that I have a right to go up to Barney Frank or any number of, of politicians or public figures and ask them questions. Um, that I can go up you know, with a voice reporter or, or take their picture or, or my notebook. And I have as much right as anybody else to, to ask them. Um, and, and I can, as we found, um, Rob was talking about an encounter we had with Barney Frank about six weeks ago, where he basically said all political activity is worthless except getting Democrats elected. You know, that just doesn't come out. The whole left you know, thinks he's great. And honestly, I thought he was pretty great until that night, too. This is what you expose when you go up and talk to people. You really talk to people and ask them the right questions. The questions that mainstream media is not asking, that Rachel Maddow is not asking, you know, that our friends in the so-called liberal media are not asking. And, and the thing about media is that you Watching TV is a, just a waste of time. It's advertisement. It's corporate culture. So I'm, I'm amazed that people actually watch the Super Bowl to, to watch the commercials. What a waste of time. You, you're not going to accomplish anything by learning about what they want to sell you. You're going to accomplish something by disengaging from television and learning about what's impacting your life. Sounds like I'm preaching, but that's what I've discovered through trial and error, through this this movement that is is actually still, in my humble opinion, is still going on. Not under the name of Occupy, but 
through collectives that have been created through Occupy to educating activists. That's what we've done. Is we've created a whole set of collectives which provide services to people who want to plug into them. And that's, I think that's going to end up being the, the testament to this movement. Yep. Um, and I don't think you were preaching at all. I think you were just laying down the truth sauce the way it should be laid down. So, Anne, I want to ask you a question specifically. John, John relayed a few moments ago that he's optimistic. He does believe we can make a difference. Where do you, where do you stand on that? Um, that might depend a little bit on my mood. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, d I don't want to um, put you on the spot, but I'm interested because, you know, I, I just like to. Good question. I mean, it also, I mean, I just read a bunch of articles about, you know, climate change and all the corruption with a collusion with Wall Street, uh, you know, about drone warfare and, and, and about the NDAA and, uh, and the violation of our civil rights there. And when I read these things, I am terribly depressed mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and um, very pessimistic because um, so many of our rights, our abilities to change things are being taken away. Um, and we have some very dire threats coming down the pipe as far as climate change goes. Um, so in that, in that sense, I'm, I'm pessimistic. When I'm Rob, what what about you? Where's where's your temp check on optimism for success? We're all and <laughs> I need you to lean in to your left a little bit. You're falling out of the frame. There you go. I said we're all fucked. <laughs> we're all fucked. <laughs> uh, well, no, uh, I, I like, like 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 I laid out before. It's I see so much going on. Um, I know I keep plugging Global Revolution, but Occupy the Comms uh, is doing great things with 15M. Um, I met with Kevin Zies and Mar Margaret Flowers at their house yesterday. They're doing amazing articles in a radio show. So I do have hope. I, I, I have hope that uh, uh, Siobhan is doing uh, a media workshop all through March, uh, four different classes on media. So, yeah, the preschool uh, at the Peace House all through March, and uh, Taylor, Taylor Hall will be uh, streaming it. Say, I do have hope. Uh, yes, we're, we're still fucked, but... We're in good company. Good. Yeah. Huh? I said we, we are, but we're in good company, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I... I kind of subscribe to what Ann said. It it's dependent on my mood and also who I'm around. And whenever I do things like this, I feel like, yeah, this we can we can do this. But when I'm alone in my own head, I'm like, oh, this is just a this is just messed up. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit um, if you guys want to. A little bit about um, DC Media Group and what's coming up, you know, specifically, you know, next weekend and kind of what we have on stack there if anybody wants to speak to that because there's going to be a lot of stuff happening around DC. Uh, um, well, we've got, we've got uh, quite a bit planned for that day. We've get, we're going to have live streaming. We're going to be it's Sport on Climate. It's 360 org, uh, Bill McKibben, and I believe Sierra Club and Hip Hop. Uh, they're all coming together. 
and it's the first time that Sierra Club has actually been a proponent of civil disobedience. That's never happened before. Um, there are some questions about funding, but the, the emphasis is to raise awareness about global warming and this threat. And we're going to have live streamers on the ground. We're going to be taking photographs. We'll be tweet I'll be live tweeting. And we'll be writing. And, um, We've also got um, DC Mike Check is, is part of the DC Media Group. And John's going to have um, an article on uh, global warming coming up later this week. Um, I think we're going to have a couple, one or two other articles um, on uh, Mike Check. DCMikeCheck.org um, about about climate change and about the upcoming um, rally on Sunday. Right, and I, I did. I'm glad you you mentioned CO and DC Mike Check because I wanted to make sure uh, for the people who aren't familiar yet with what we're trying to do. You know, we have the the media group together, but we're also reaching out to. Why don't you describe some of the partners? Because I've been really pushing We Act Radio. Uh, because I think they're a phenomenal group, but maybe tell people a little bit about you know DC Mike Check and We Act and you know the the people we're involved with. Um, yeah, Mike Check was originally the Occupy Washington Times, and it came out of um, the Occupy movement in DC, and it's morphed into DC Mike Check. Um, it was a print edition. Um, and then late last spring, it morphed into a website, and it, we still cover, um, John and I are both part of the editorial collective, um, we still cover things that are um, of interest to the grassroots, to the people. We try to give voice to alternative viewpoints um, and all the issues that were relevant to Occupy and, uh, you know, Right. And it, we we act radio. We act radio started a little more than a year ago, and a crazy bunch of guys, but some very mainstream sort of people. Uh, David Schuster, uh, Mark Levine, uh, Peter Callahan is station manager. Uh, I work mostly with Ramon Freeman and Ron Pinchback. The six PM show Monday through Friday. Uh, they're, they're, uh, Ramon Freeman and Ron Pinchback are not your everyday progressive people. They're more like Occupy minded people, uh, where it's more aggressive progressive or pissed off progressives. Um, so it's there are kind of people, and uh, uh, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese have a show on Monday at. 10 o'clock in the morning, and they live stream that as well from We Act Radio. Right. And, uh, and they've welcomed us in whenever th – it's an open-door policy. If we want to go to We Act Radio and promote something or talk, talk about a topic, uh, come on, Freeman, at weactradio.com. The door is open. Yep. And it's it's been like that for the year that they're – they they opened up the doors. Um, they're just a great bunch of people. It's not your regular radio station. I, and I highly recommend people listen to it. And it is on AM, and they do stream, so you can listen live on the internet. It's fantastic programming, and they are seriously progressive, but not they're not your grandma's progressives. That's for sure. And uh, I know Rob Rob does some bits for them I've, i think ann does and uh they're really great programming i love watching kevin and margaret's show when i can when i can see it um in, in fact i sent them a heads up on a guest that, that i think they may be interested in but it's important it's like these integrations of all these levels of media it's becoming more sophisticated and deeper and richer and that's what we're trying to do is have more context and and more layers to the stories so we can get this information out um the chatters want to ask a few questions if you guys have some time is that okay i'll read them off to you 
Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, the first one is Ping wants to know how can we organize at least a million people in D.C. when it gets warmer? A million people when it gets warmer. Um, I, I, the only way to do that is if cities communicate better. Uh, one of the problems that I've seen is is uh, communicating with New York uh, is very difficult. If we're going to get a lot of people together, then Occupy Wall Street needs to uh, do better. With because I know I've reached out to them. Uh, Occupy Carlisle has reached out to them, and it's like knocking on a door that just does not open. Uh, and it, it, the lines of communication need to get better. I, I know the group over here, I, the Occupy DC Action Committee, they try very hard to, uh, to get more people involved. And it's difficult. It's very difficult. So the answer to ping is uh, they need to ping Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Philly and Occupy Boston. and and. And another thing, when Punk Boy was out here, is I think it's kind of unfair that all of these huge events seem to happen on the East Coast. And some of the things have to happen on the West Coast. And again, it, it's about collaboration. Uh, there needs to be a network. And I know, Artister, you've been working on it with Vox Collective. Uh, people need to start, you know, not... We don't, we don't need a centralized location, but we do need to have that crossroads of communication. Mm -hmm. And people need to do better with that. Do you, do you so, think that people are resistant to it, or it's just complicated enough where they're focused on different things? Wait, one more time? I said, do you think that, like, the different cities are resistant to helping each other out, or is it just that everybody is so involved with their own situations they don't have the time or energy to make those bridges? Um, I'm going to be a big wimp and you'll avoid that question because I don't want to be critical. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have no experience to answer the question. I, I will just, I'll wager that, that there's a lot of energy being spent on on surviving right now for a lot of the activists. Right. No, I'll, well, I'll answer honestly. Oh, hold on. I, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. What, what's important is that it's not always the issue of communication. It's the issue of resources as well. Mm -hmm. People have to be willing to expend resources and put, I hate to say it, but capital is, is necessary to create these things, but whether it's communication. I mean, none of us are really doing this on a wage. We're using our own resources. We're all blessed that we have jobs, uh, at least for all resources, the three of us. But if you're going to uh, call an action somewhere like Gadbusters did last year for, for Halloween, you better put some resources behind what you call forward because you can't just call an action in another city and then expect everybody to come up with something. You have to put some some might and some muscle behind what you do. So part of it is definitely the communication issue and reaching out and setting up and being cooperative between sites. Well, I, I think the problem is is economics of it. Um, you have cities maybe like Philadelphia who doesn't have a lot of money and they feel kind of discouraged. Right. Or Occupy Trenton, or, or as compared to maybe Occupy Wall Street, who has, you know, they have a huge bank account. Maybe they don't feel the need to reach out to to the smaller cities because they have their own shit going on. I, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, I, I spoke with Vlad a couple days ago, and he was able to arbitrate uh, opening up of the tweet boat. OWS. So, you know, getting back to hope and getting back to organizing bigger actions 
yes, I, I think it's possible because people are listening to, you know, it, it needs to open up. It needs to become more public. There needs to be more access for different people to get involved. And uh, there, there was this reaction from different destructive forces coming in through the GAs. And I understand why it went behind closed doors. But it needs to loosen up a little bit, enough for, the, for activism to grow. Because it's been somewhat stifled you know, outside of New York City. And we haven't seen... We haven't seen tens of thousands of people, even in New York. Right. So we need to look at, at what's going on and how it's being managed, I would assume. Like, you know. uh, and also, you need to ask yourself, what is the effectiveness of, of a rally other than to articulate a point? The, the rally is the beginning. Being on the street, yelling at a building, is only going to gain a certain amount of results. You have to be willing to do outreach. You have to be willing to, to, to create the collectives of education. And you also have to be willing to create relationships with people in your community that are going to grow your movement or, or your collective. You have to reach out. You can't just expect them to come. I mean, when we set up our tents in this in this, in this park behind us, we didn't, at one point we had about 300 tents out here, but we weren't creating relationships with the people we needed. Uh, in other words, we weren't creating uh, relationships with business and with other people in the city. We didn't reach out enough to other, um, I guess, uh, With, with to, to other nonprofits, to other groups that had already created the infrastructure to make changes that we were trying to make. Right. So um, that's well, important. I'm gonna I'm gonna spread the blame around a little bit too because um, you know, like I was trying to describe before, there was so much energy put into you know maintenance and plus everything that was going on that you know um, there could have been more wisdom about outreach, about, um, you know, how the movement was going to spread in the future. But I know that, you know, amongst my friends, my politically involved liberal friends, they had a lot of sympathy and support for Occupy at first, and they knew that they were very interested that I was involved, but it was kind of like an aha uh -huh kind of thing. Yeah. They could not, they would not get involved themselves. Themselves getting involved, yep. even though I encouraged them to occupy it in their own way, it didn't necessarily mean yelling on the streets. Um, I've, I've got to blame people in general, you know, the public at large, for sitting back and letting, you know, some kids in the park take the heat um, and leaving it up to them. Because honestly, most of the people in these parks were either. Homeless, uh, a lot of homeless runaway kids, uh, a lot of mentally unstable people, uh, a lot of people who, who were really quite dysfunctional. Uh, you know, and I think that was a beautiful thing about Occupy, bringing fringe people together. But it left, uh, it was a vital, important moment of rising up. And the public at large said, you do it. Yep. And and left it up, you know, really to a very vulnerable population. Right. And it, to add to this, I have enormous respect for Alexis Goldstein from, I think it's Occupy the SEC from Occupy Wall Street. And there was another, it was on the Chris Hayes show a month or two ago. And it was Alexis Goldstein and another Occupy Wall Street person, and two 60s, 1960s activists. And the 60s activists uh, criticized Alexis and this other OWS activist and said, well, you didn't engage in the institutions. I hear a lot of people saying that, 
that that has to be different. But I agree with Anne. It's people didn't step up here in Washington D.C. Two blocks in the other direction, uh, the Franklin School. There was a sit-in. That the Franklin School was a center for the homeless, and there was a, they went broke into the building and did a sit-in in the building. They, I I remember it was one night, and several people got arrested. The police broke into the building and arrested them. And uh, so there was that engagement, but there wasn't the public response. The propaganda against what we were doing, what Occupy was doing. And, and I think Cooney, wasn't there a sit-in at, at Cooney College, New York City? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's they did engage these institutions. So I, I and I, I think the public didn't step up. And maybe, I maybe it's take your show and Northern show, OWNN and Global Revolution, to build this even more as we get smarter through the months. And it's I think that to add on, on to what Bob is saying, I think it's critical that all of the networks that you like, for example, the one you created network with others and, and link up to create nodes of information flow and, and do whatever it takes because it's not like this is it's going to cost us any more if we just have, uh, send each other shows out. We're just reaching more people. And uh, it, i got to admit, it was it's the pessimist inside of me is that I was extremely disappointed that more people in the boomer generation didn't become involved in what was happening here. Oh yeah, you'd have your group sometimes show up and say, thank you very much, give us a hundred dollar bill and walk away. But that doesn't do it. We need your feet on the ground, your community. Involvement in your community is what's going to take. Take. It doesn't have to be an occupation of the parks. It means becoming involved and fired in, in your community, getting involved in that matter. And, 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 and I also need to mention Occupy Earth. They had a they had a really uh, good online action yesterday. Uh, I missed it, but I heard it was good. And opinionated, and all the people at Occupy Earth uh, deserve an, an enormous amount of credit. They've been around for a long time as well, doing great stuff. Uh, something, <coughs> uh, Keith, Organizer X, uh, found this uh, thunderclap, and it's since he found Thunderclap, which is another networking tool, you know, I found two other news networking sites that uh, DC Media Group will be able to tap into in our feeds uh, for Anne's content and, and John's videos and interviews and, and all of our stuff will get out there more. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing this smarter as the months go on. Right. I, I think we've come a long way in just our group in a month, <laughs> you know, just finding yeah, out how we can integrate it and all that. It's, it's amazing what we have actually accomplished just since we started meeting, I believe, our, when was our first meeting? In, in January. January 16th. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, six, <laughs> five, five weeks ago. You remember that? That's good. And... It just seems like so much has happened since then. Yeah. I want to make just, you know, just weigh in on a point because I kind of agree with what Ann and Rob were saying. And the one of the biggest lessons I've learned in the last year was how apathetic the average citizen everywhere is. Apathetic and not willing to engage. And, and it just is mind-blowing to me. And when I was in Charlotte at the DNC, I was interviewing people on the street that that were not protesters, and they were they were easy they were fine to say I don't know and I don't really care, and I was astonished and it really it kind of messed me up for about a month because you know there was a whole lot more of them than there were us um i want to get another question in and then we'll kind of wrap it up because i think this is a good question um in light of occupy austin is starting to re rebuild their encampment 
you know they're doing a pop up. Somebody Sue's asked if do you think that there would be value in reestablishing the camps? Uh, I, I think the camps were a mess. Yeah, uh, I, I, I have to, I have to agree with Rob on that. I think that your, it's good, it's a good rallying point, but you, you lose control of management because you really don't have a. A consensus. You're trying to build consensus, but you're you're too open to the problems in an open environment where people just can come in and co-opt. Or uh, there's many problems that that can come up. You had to really manage your, your facilities and be on the same sheet of music, and that's very difficult to do when you've got an open forum where basically anyone can come in. I I think if you pop up camps and then break them down after a time period between a week or a month and then take a break and then do it again, that would be more effective than trying to do a long-term camp. The, I was going to say, occupying, occupation is a tactic. Occupying public space is a tactic. And, um, you know, doing an indefinite occupation like that as a camp is, is difficult. And, and there are different ways probably of occupying public space that creatively um, take up for themselves, like art installations. We've, we've tried different things in, in McPherson and, um, since the tents have been gone. You know, there are things like, you know, information, uh, information tents or, or booths or simply doing, you know, coming together for a few hours for performances or engaging the public. There are ways of um, occupying public space that don't mean settling in in a tent for months at a time. Um, but I do think it's important to reclaim public spaces as um, public forums, either for, for protests, for expressing ideas, and communicating with each other. And I'd like to also add to what Ann just said. Uh, in early December, a collective group of people, myself and another lady by the name of Lacey, got together and created what we called a really, really free market. And we occupied a small part of the ground in Malcolm X Park, which is also known as Meridian Park, and it was covered in DC mic check. But what that was, was we set up some area where people could bring items that they no longer used, that were serviceable and usable, and other people could just come and take without any obligation to pay, you could either just come and take, or you could just come and leave and leave without taking anything, but it was basically an opportunity for people to exchange goods at no cost to anybody. And it benefited the community because it took people out of repressive monetary systems. Um, and it also, it saved labor, it, it recycled goods, and we actually plan to do it again on March the 23rd in the same location. So using public space is our right to do. That's what it's there for, public space. There should be no reason why we should have to have a permit to do that unless there's a conflict. But they require a permit, no problem. We'll get a permit. We didn't get a permit. We did it. And over $10,000 of retail, very valuable retail goods exchanged hands. And it's a good way to pe get people thinking about a different kind of economy. I mean, this is a barter economy. Actually, it's not even barter. It's just take what you want. But just to think that, you know, the rocking into a store and buying something is the only way the economy functions may not be it. As far as the camps, uh, you look at Egypt, and it, and it kind of works in Egypt. And I, I don't want to say, uh, from my perspective, I didn't think the camps like Pam was saying, over the, over the long term. And I could be wrong. And it, the other thing I, I want to say about this is is I don't know the conditions in Austin. Maybe they need to do it. Maybe there are things going on in Austin that I don't see and I don't understand. And, and, it, and it's a necessity. It, it, and it might be a necessity. Again. Who knows? Yep. I, here in D.C. there is a history of different camps that have popped up uh, through our U.S. history. 
and, and it had become out of necessity because people weren't paying attention. Right? It happened during the Civil Rights Movement. It happened uh, back in the 30s. So who's to say? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, each culture is, is each look, each region is going to have a different culture. What works for Austin may not work here. Mm -hmm. I, w I would definitely not dissuade them, but I would certainly advise from my own experience that things be managed carefully and that it not be indefinite. And if there, there are problems, that those problems be addressed without repressive behaviors. Right. Um, okay, well, it's uh, you guys have been outside for an hour, almost two hours, because you were there at 7.30, so I want to, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to leave with the people before you call it a night? Yeah, I just want to run down the schedule for Sunday real quick. Okay. Keith, Organizer X, will be streaming at 9 o'clock from DuPont Circle. There's an action uh, starting at 10 o'clock. We will be doing the the pre-rally show uh, from an undisclosed location. We're not sure where we're doing it yet. It might be down at the monument. Uh, if it's too cold or rainy, we're, we'll find another location to give uh, give uh, information about what the rally is about, about environmentalism. And uh, if you go to DC Media Group dot info. Uh, you can find our schedule there. We have other things coming up. The IMF, uh, there are actions going on. CPAC, APAC, uh, there are a lot of things that will be happening here in D.C. over the next eight weeks, uh, a lot more than you've seen recently. Uh, I won't be standing out in the low freezing weather, thank God. Yeah, it's going to be a busy time. Um, and you or John have anything you want to close with? Um, I, if, if any of this has piqued your interest about the history of Occupy DC, you can go to my blog, coolrevolution.net, look through the archive. John has also posted um, a wonderful um, reflection on the day of the eviction. Um, lots of stuff on the tent of dreams and what it stood for. Um, and also look forward to coverage on my blog of um, and on dcmikecheck.org of um, the upcoming Climate Forward Rally this coming weekend. I, I would just like to thank uh, viewers for taking time to watch your streams and your programming. It's very valuable. Um, we're all volunteer. Nobody gets paid for this. We're not asking for money here, but we would ask you to consider getting involved in your community or maybe creating one of your collectives. You can find out how to do that by reading any of our blog posts and, and reaching out to us, either through Twitter or through our live streams or through our media. And I wanted to thank you, our visitor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. I look forward to the weekend. So uh, thank you guys for spending your evenings with us. And Rob, being a, you know, you'll have to go home and tell your daughter you were out doing the good work again. And, uh, John and Ann, it's good to have you guys here. Thank you so much, Organizer X, if you're still watching. Thanks for participating in the chat. Uh, Jen Knox, I hope you're doing well. You guys need to listen to Tipping Point Radio on Ustream. Um, she gives almost twice day updates. And uh, also check out our friends on We Act Radio and uh, DC Mic Check. And stay tuned. We'll be on dcmediagroup.info with all our streams, all our live tweets, the blogging, and the photo streams. So coming up this weekend, there's going to be a lot of activity, so keep an eye on that. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. I really appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon.